This is AHA Today at the Cardiology Update in Davos, Switzerland uh, in 2017. I'm Tom Lusher, I'm Editor-in-Chief of the European Heart Journal, and I'm talking with uh, Filippo Crea, Associate Editor at our journal and very active in the field of acute coronary syndromes. He's uh, giving a lecture here in Davos on uh, the coronary microcirculation and its role in acute coronary syndromes. Welcome, Filippo. Thank you. So, um, as cardiologists, we mainly look at the big arteries uh, because there we can enter with stents and catheters and so on. So why should the microcirculation be important uh, as we don't see it? Yeah, it is invisible and yeah. this is a major limitation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we are learning that microvascular dysfunction is much more frequent than we thought before. Think of stable patients, yes. uh, patients with stable angina. Well, 50% of patients with st uh, stable angina and the positive stress test do not have obstructive atherosclerosis. And we are learning that in the majority of these patients, the problem is microvascular dysfunction. Think of myocardial infarction. 10% of patients with myocardial infarction do not have obstructive atherosclerosis. And in many cases, the problem is microvascular dysfunction. So how can you prove me that microvascular dysfunction plays a role? I mean, why do you know that a patient with acute coronary syndrome doesn't have myocarditis or something else? So how do you make the difference? Well, when we come to acute coronary syndrome, the way to prove the role of microvascular dysfunction is acetylcholine testing. Mm -hmm. If we inject acetylcholine in these patients and the problem is microvascular dysfunction, what they get is uh, chest pain and ST depression, ischemic changes in the absence of epicardial spasm. So you do this on a routine basis in your institution? Uh, yes, we do it in uh, stable patients in particular because again, 50% of patients yeah, with yeah. stable angina do not have obstruction. Uh, and uh, this is a way to investigate microvascular dysfunction. The other way to investigate microvascular dysfunction is to assess coronary flow reserve. If it is less than 2 or 2.5, uh, well, we can make diagnosis of microvascular dysfunction. And is it safe to do this acetylcholine test in these patients? Yes, starting with low dosages. Mm -hmm. uh, we start with 5 micrograms to 50, 100 micrograms. Mm -hmm. If you keep nitrates close to you yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you have 12 lead DCG recording, yeah. it's pretty safe. 12 lead DCG recording is important not only because you make diagnosis based on DCG, but also because early ischemic changes prompt uh, nitrate yeah, administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you need trans uh, translucent uh, spe uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. special leads to. to, to, to okay. So in, in let's start with uh, patients with stable coronary artery disease, and it's true, uh, particularly in women, uh, I think there's a preponderance in women. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we, have, we have often the situation, we do a cast, we do maybe even right heart catheterization, everything's fine, and we let them home and say, you're, you're healthy, uh, uh, and, uh, but you do it differently. You want to prove that there's microvascular dysfunction. Now let's see, as, as, as say that you, you did prove this. What, what do you do with it? Well, it is important because as shown, for instance, by Marcelo Di Carli mm -hmm. in, in Boston, patients with angina, no obstructive atherosclerosis, and coronary flow reserve less than two, have a worse outcome compared to patients with flow reserve more than two. Mm -hmm. And this is the same for men and women. You are right, it's more prevalent among women, but the outcome is not good for men and women alike. Uh, well, what's, what is the clinical consequence? Well, first is that we know that the pain in that particular patient comes from the heart. Yeah, you have a diagnosis. Well, these patients sometimes become psychiatric. Yeah, they come to you. I see many, many yeah. women, postmenopausal yeah, yeah. women, who come to me desperate because nobody believes that, that their the pain, pain comes yeah. from the heart. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. And second, you, you have, I mean, we don't have evidence-based medicine, but we have this signal on the outcome. And the thing that makes sense in these patients to really have good control of risk factors and the close follow-up. So these are the clinical implications. Now, obviously, also physiologically, the small vessels are a bit different than the large ones. So... Uh, Nitrates don't work as well. No, no nitrates do not work. Yeah. And in, in, uh, in uh, um, 
old and new and novel antianginal drugs, uh, they, they work. I mean, the individual response to treatment is remarkably different among patients, but eventually you, you find the right combination. So we, how do you start? What do you first try? I start based on symptoms. If mm -hmm. patients mainly complain of rest angina, mm -hmm. I prefer to use calcium antagonist. Yes. Yeah. If it's mainly effort angina, beta blockers. Yes. And then ranolazine and devabradine can also be used. Right. And in some of these patients, some of these patients have the sensitive heart syndrome. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they are very susceptible to painful stimuli. Mm -hmm. In these patients, a denosine antagonist can be useful like aminophilin or mm -hmm. bamifilin, yeah. because we know that adenosine is the mediator of the anginal pain, yeah. and the antagonist of adenosine can work. And also amipramine. Amipramine is very useful in the treatment of chronic pain, and yeah. in some of these patients another is another potential form of treatment. So this is a tricyclic, uh, tricyclic yes. compound? It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine long ago, yeah. but, uh, but the, 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 the information is there. In so it's a symptomatic it's treatment? It's a symptomatic treatment yeah, which yeah. can be important in patients who have really a difficult life because of symptom severity. Yeah. So why don't we have large trials testing these uh, compounds as we do in epicardial coronary artery disease? Well, for the simple reason that microvascular in China has been accepted as a syndrome only a few years ago. Yeah. For the first time, it's yeah. been in guidelines in 2013. Yeah. So really, we have to build up now yeah. this knowledge and, and plan trials to test treatments. Yeah, I think we, we, we really should push forward to that because I also see that in our CAS lab, we have a lot of patients and we send them home and uh, it's not a very satisfying situation, both for the patients and for the, the physician. To finish up, I have another question. You wrote uh, this uh, famous paper uh, in our journal about, uh, or provocative paper, uh, that maybe uh, in HEFPEF for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, microcirculation may be important as well. Well, parallel tales, because now we know that 50% of anginal patients do not have obstructive atherosclerosis, and 50% of patients with heart failure do not have systolic dysfunction. Yes. So in both conditions are highly prevalent and they may have a common denominator. There is growing evidence that uh, uh, microvascular dysfunction also plays a role in causing uh, HFPF, at least in a sizable proportion of patients. It is another interesting uh, field of investigation for the future. And the last but not least in Dacosubo syndrome yeah, yeah. as well, microvascular sure. dysfunction is, is, yeah. the, is the pathogenetic mechanism. Yeah, so let's push for trials so we know more when we meet again to talk about this important subject. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you.